Hello everyone, welcome to this rather special video of mine as it is the very first video I've ever made where I use my own voice for commentary. And on a less personal note it's also special because this video would not have been possible to make without the help of the awesome guys at Killhouse Games who were kind enough to provide me with a key for the brand new game Door Kickers 2 Test Force North currently in early access. So once again, thank you guys for giving me an opportunity to review your game. Quick warning before we jump into this, I'm not a native English speaker, so I would like to apologize in advance for any grammatical or pronunciation errors I might make. Alright, so for those of you who don't know the original Door Kickers, it is a 2D top-down real-time strategy game where you get to take charge of a SWAT team. Your task is to analyze the different situations presented to you, based on blueprints of the target areas and the intel you are given. Customize your team's equipment accordingly and plan their routes and actions to restore order and leave the bad guys either in handcuffs or body bags by the end of it. You can strive for perfection and try to create the perfect plan before intrusion, or alternatively you can guide your team in real time throughout their missions, giving them orders on the fly. There is a vast number of missions available for you to play, as well as 6 campaigns that add an extra layer of difficulty to your experience where if your team members die during missions, they will stay dead for the remnants of the campaign. Additionally for campaigns only, there is the optional Iron Man mode where no retries are allowed during or after missions for maximal immersion and pain, recommended for YouTubers and Mesoists. There is also a level editor as well as modding support for maximal replayability. Please remember that as of the making of this video, the game is still in its early access version, which means that everything you are about to see is potentially a subject to change by the game's full release. And with that out of the way, it's finally time to see what Door Kickers 2 Task Force North is all about. Eyes on the target.
As you can see, there's a lot to unpack here. The most important features that give Door Kickers its identity have remained, and many of them have received a fresh polish, but even more new ones have made their ways onto our planning boards. Starting with the major improvements, the amount of breaching methods have been greatly increased. This time around we can not only breach doors, but windows and walls as well. Open it stealthily or kick it down aggressively, it's your decision how you deal with doors. Kicking has the added benefit of knocking people down if they happen to stand close enough on the other side, while taking the more gentle approach can help keeping you undetected if you wish to stalk your prey before going loud. Windows have also became an available point of entry, but they are a bit trickier than doors. If you wish to move through one, you first have to clear it. This means breaking the glass and tearing down drapes if there are any. Drapes are also a new feature in the game, and they serve to block view as well as thrown projectiles from being thrown through windows. Once the window is cleared, you then have to go through a quite time-consuming climbing animation, which gives more than enough time for any bad guys to take you out if you do not have proper cover provided by your nearby friendlies. Moving on to the feature that everybody wants to talk about, the wall breaching charge. After all, who wants to deal with doors or windows if you can just blow a massive hole in the wall? This brand new gadget is the best friend of any operators who don't like taking chances when making their entry. It can be placed on almost any wall surfaces and then detonated remotely from a safe distance. It has an impressively sized kill and stun radius, making it an excellent choice for taking out large numbers of enemies within a short period of time. You can even use it on doors if you feel like the slap charge just isn't enough to make a good first impression to those unfortunate enough to be standing on the other side. Oh, and you don't need to worry about any obstacles getting in your way. As long as they aren't too big or heavy, they will go flying across the room making your job even easier. The only thing this puppy cannot do to make your entrance even more impressive is rolling out red carpet for your soldiers. Other core improvements include features based around movement. These are the abilities to crouch and sprint. Sprinting is an ability that all DK veterans would have begged to have. Being able to quickly cover large distances at the expense of being slower on the draw is situational but extremely useful nonetheless. Sometimes you just quickly want to catch up to your team instead of needlessly wasting everyone's time. In other cases, you are forced to chase down targets or sprint your way across sections of the map in order to reach your objective before the timer runs out, so moving quickly is even more important now than ever before. Crouching, on the other hand, is a fundamental part of the game's staff system that is not yet fully implemented. In the game's current state, every single mission can be completed without using it. Crouching prevents your soldiers from firing their weapons, which allows you to sneak past unaware enemy guards to reach more advantageous positions where you will be able to lay ambushes from. Despite not being able to fire their weapons, troopers can still throw grenades from a crouching position, which is extremely useful when used near windows. While being behind cover in a crouching position, your troopers are hidden from the enemy's cone of vision which can help with sneaking as well as surviving incoming heavy fire as long as you don't get flanked or blown up. The planning kit has also received a much needed polish along with some cool new features that will bring joy to all those who like using single plans such as myself. No longer are we forced to remake entire paths because of some minor adjustments, now we can just simply reconnect paths after we are done modifying. Breaching has also been improved as from now on we can select our appointment with a simple click, which is far more convenient than having to redraw all paths going through that one specific door in order to change our appointment. The user interface in general has become much smoother and more user friendly. I feel like categorizing the visual and audio improvements as anything other than major would do this game injustice. It is impossible not to get slapped in the face by just how much better the game looks, sounds and feels to play compared to the first one. The textures and animations are much more detailed and seem a lot less cartoony. The sounds of gunfire and explosions sound weighty and realistic. And the music, while might not be as amazing as something made by Hans Zimmer himself, is also well made and does a good job at keeping your experience on the battlefield all the more memorable. 
Both the interior and the exterior environments are filled with tons of details. Items and furnitures all have their own physics and are responsive to explosions and other physical effects by falling on the ground, scattering on the floor or even flying across rooms. This also applies for debris generated by player-controlled soldiers as they destroy doors and walls while moving from room to room taking down insurgents in the process. You could take it as subjective opinion, but I think it all makes for quite an immersive experience. When playing this game you don't feel like you are raiding artificially made maps in a video game, you feel like you are raiding some poor Arabic man's home that's been turned into an insurgent hideout, or the mansion of a local warlord which currently serves as an enemy stronghold. As far as I can tell, many people didn't get captivated by the original game's gameplay due to how it performed poorly in the fields of graphics and ergasms. But if I know one thing for sure, then it's that this is definitely not going to be an issue this time around, because let me tell you right now, for me, Playing this game is an absolute blast. And lastly, while it might not be an actual improvement, it's important to formally address the game's transition of settings from commanding SWAT units in Western civilization to leading coalitional forces fighting in the Middle East. Time to talk about our band of merry men who will be leading the combat. Let's start with classes. Currently, there are only 4 classes available, but it has been confirmed that there will be more classes added to the game as well as different squad types for us to choose from at the beginning of missions, but more on that later. The only class that has remained from the first game is the backbone of any functional squad, the Assault class. The Assault class represents the tip of the spear, they are mostly seen leading their teams as their point men. Assault units can handle most situations presented to them rather well, which makes them a good choice for performing non-specific tasks, but where they truly shine is CQC and room clearing. Second on the list is the support class. Support units are useful when dealing with large groups of enemies. They use machine guns equipped with bipods that require cover to be successfully deployed. This is important because most machine guns are too heavy to be efficiently used without their user being stationary making the support unit one of the worst choice for conducting high mobility duties such as room clearing and flanking. Our third class is the Grenadier. They try to deliver the best of both worlds by mixing the speed of the assault units with the deadliness of the support class. The rifle is longer than the ones averagely used by assault units, which makes the Grenadiers a slightly less optimal choice in close range engagements, but that also gives them an edge in medium range gunfights. Unfortunately, the grenade launcher isn't going to be anyone's most reliable tool in combat. Launched grenades are highly effective against targets hiding behind cover, but the ones out in the open are a different story to say the least. Really, nigga? In terms of lethality, the launcher also finishes in second place behind the hand grenade, due to the fact that the former does not deal fragmentation damage surrounding its immediate blast radius. So what's the point of using the grenade launcher, you might ask? How about the fact that each grenadier carries 5 launchable grenades on top of the 4 hand thrown ones of your choice? Or that it doesn't take more than about a second to fire and reload each of those grenades? Combining this with the fact that grenadiers are at least decent at fighting on any range makes them quite a valuable asset. You can pull off some really aggressive maneuvers with these guys, just don't get overly confident with those grenades. It might say US military on the outer shell, but they were without a doubt provided cheaply and humbly by the People's Republic of China. And for our last class in the game's current build, let's talk about the Marksman. The Marksman is yet another addition between Door Kickers 2 that was much requested for the previous game. They excel at long-range engagements, being capable of taking down targets with great precision and stopping power. They work best when tasked with covering the rest of your team from a distance, preventing them from getting flanked by the enemy. Depending on their optics and rifles of choice, they can be utilized for room clearing, but it's recommended to leave those duty classes better suited for close range combat. Technically, there is one last unit who's part of the team, and that is the sniper. Snipers are off-map units appearing in specific maps to provide their team with long range support and they are most commonly seen on hostage rescue missions. Snipers were actually present in the original door kickers as well, but the way they work in the second game is a little different. Previously, the color of the sniper's scope and laser meant to indicate whether it's ready to fire or not. However, this time around, as long as they are focused on a target, you can force the snipers to fire whenever you would like them to. Based on where their laser sight is pointing, you can hit targets by timing your shots right. 
without waiting for the reticle and the laser sight to turn green, which basically just means that the shot will be a guaranteed hit. You can also order snipers to survey specific parts of the map which helps with prioritizing targets. Moving on to equipment, there are a number of new gadgets to our disposal. These are also available for every class. Small grenades that are ideal for concealing your team from heavy enemy fire and frag grenades that are basically the big brothers of flashbangs, handy for dealing with barricaded hostiles. Stingers are hand-thrown grenades that contain rubber balls. Enemies don't particularly care about them, but they are useful for scaring off civilians before starting to tear the place apart. The slap charge is basically a quick and small version of the wall bridge charge, only usable on doors. Then there's the dynamic hammer which allows you to bash reinforced doors open in a single hit, but it's very heavy, which lowers the carrier's mobility. Lastly, there is the spy camera, which has also seen some improvements. Previously you could only use it on doors, but this time around you are able to peek around corners with it as well. Unfortunately though, large metal gates are not compatible with it. As far as weapons are concerned, most of the variety that we can currently see are in regards for the primary weapons of the Assault and Marksman classes, as well as handguns that are non-class specific. The support class gets to pick between three different machine guns and the Grenadier does not have any alternatives for the primary thus far. There are no submachine guns, shotguns, shields or multiple armor options and the amount of customizability in general is far less than before, but let's not forget that we are still far from the game's full release. We now also have weapon customizability as a new feature, although there are few things that we are allowed to change just yet, namely the optics and ammo types. Optics mainly affect the speed and precision at which soldiers switch between and engage targets at different ranges, as well as reload speed, maneuverability and the soldier's overall mobility. Ammo types as of right now are unbalanced and unimportant. Basically all they do is allow you to increase your weapon's damage output for free of any downsides or cost, so in other words, it's statistical cheat mode. I believe that if there are any features within the game that will definitely be reworked, then it's the ammo types. You can still personalize your troopers the same way you could in the first game. You can select their portrait and change their names to your will, you can also keep tabs on their ranks, skill levels and other records such as the amount of missions that they have participated in. However, you can no longer change the classes of your soldiers, every single one of them has a predetermined class of their own and so you have to make do with what you are given. So no 12 grenadiers at a time unfortunately. With classes being less diverse, the nature of combat has also changed dramatically. Fewer tactical possibilities mean more straightforward gameplay and combat itself has become the center of attention and so we have new features to make it more flavorful. First off, we now have unarmed enemy combatants who can pick up weapons after getting alarmed. If you can close the distance between your troopers and such enemies before they can find a weapon, then you can catch them off guard and force them to surrender. You can then handcuff these enemies the same way you would do with HVTs. Enemies rely on explosives a lot more and they have a wide variety of options to choose from as well, ranging from hand grenades, rocket launchers and even suicide bombers. With the exception of the suicide bomber, enemies usually only rely on explosives when fighting against stationary soldiers, which is meant to emphasize the importance of keeping your team moving as much as you can. Another thing enemies tend to do is use cover for blind firing. Personally I'm not a fan of this feature as it usually makes single planning a real nightmare. The only way to counter blind fire is by using explosives, flanking tactics, sniper support or hiding long enough so that your foe gets tired of wasting their ammunition and leave their cover. Enemies randomly using blind firing can hinder your entire plan because your soldiers are unable to shoot them directly, so you are forced to start improvising. Some enemies can also use pre-firing when they feel threatened. They may shoot through doors, drapes and holes created by explosives. Similar as it may be to the blind firing, it is far less bothersome to deal with as your soldiers can actually take out the threat by themselves. 
Interestingly enough, bullets don't seem to pass through doors and drapes, so right now all it does is look cool. But I'm positive this will have a more drastic effect on our experience in the future. A more than welcome change is that friendly VIPs can finally be assigned go codes and they can also perform various actions such as sprinting and crouching, clearing windows and bolting through them. They can also be told not to move as long as there are enemies in their cone of vision. This is an important change as previously VIPs were quite bothersome to deal with because they were only able to perform the most basic actions such as opening doors and walking around. One of my favorite new features is the melee combat. It has a skill meter assigned to it which is currently not part of the game but despite that all of our troopers are able to utilize it nonetheless. Being able to bash their opponents in their immediate proximity gives all your troopers an extra edge over the insurgents when it comes to CQC engagements. I love this feature, not just because it's entertaining to watch as insurgents get their crap beaten out of them, but also because it's a big improvement compared to the old game's combat system, where melee simply wasn't an option and that actually led to quite a few awkward deaths. Now I would like to talk about the features that are confirmed to be part of the game's full version. I was able to put this list together by reading the comments of the developers on the game's Steam discussions and I've got to say, these guys are possibly the most responsive and communicative developers I have ever seen. So let's just say that I am quite optimistic in regards for the game's future. There are some features that are technically part of the game but are currently disabled due to instability issues with the game's engine. These include the creation of pre-planning points for holes made by Wallbreeze charges and the workshop support which will include sharing mods as well as user-made maps, maybe even campaigns. Do you remember my tease with the unit types earlier? So currently we have the United States Army Rangers available, but later on there will be more unit types to choose from. Unit types will differ in skins, classes, weapons and gadgets among other things. Since the rangers are pretty straightforward, I am assuming that the next unit the developers are going to release are going to be more focused on staff and higher tech gear. For example, drones are already confirmed. It is also confirmed that staff will be a possible playstyle, though whether they implement a staff class, like they did in the first game, or allow us to put suppressors on the weapons of different classes, is still to be seen. It's been hinted at that there will be undercover units probably dressed as civilians that could help blending in with crowds and possibly slow down the enemy's reaction time during combat, but that's just speculation. Night missions as well as nighttime combat equipment such as night vision goggles are confirmed to arrive later on according to the game's store page. It's also been confirmed that there will be a medic class specifically available for the rangers and that there will also be a medic kit of some kind possibly available for more advanced units. Furthermore, we have confirmation that ballistic shields are more than likely not making a comeback this time around because they will be useless against rifle calibers that are commonly used by insurgent forces. Currently all the voice lines in the game are the same as they were in the first game. And yes, that means that females still have male voices. But that's allegedly going to change once the game reaches its final stage of early access. Line firing is expected to see changes in order to make them more realistic. Hopefully this means that they will no longer break single plans with their mere existence. And lastly, as a quick reminder, one of the developers have told us that the original Dorky Curse had way less features during its stages of early access, so there is no reason for us to be skeptical. There is still a long road ahead of us. The game is intended to be released from early access within 12 to 16 months. I left a bunch of smaller technical details out since I feel like this video has been dragged on for long enough already. I hope you found this video helpful or otherwise entertaining. If you feel like I've managed to get you interested in the game then be sure to check out the video's description after you are done watching. I will link the game's store page as well as community discussions page down there so that you can go and find out more for yourselves. It's been me, Jose First. Thanks for watching. Signing off.